July 10th, 2017 was a date that Nate was the first person in my life who knew, I knew well who died. After his death, for the first time in my life, I faced big questions. Is there evidence for God? Does the Bible contradict science? Where did this thing we call the New Testament come from? I had all these questions, but for a year I never found a satisfying answer. The inspiration for my project to find, was to find out what the truth was about God's existence in religion. And spoiler alert, after all my work, I think the truth is Christianity. <laughs> so, oh, my theme verse is 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Before I get into my bubbles, I wanted to briefly explain what apologetics was for anyone who didn't know. So, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines apologetics as a branch of theology devoted to the defense of the divine origin and authority of Christianity. And also, I included a quote that I really like by Travis Satterfield. He says, apologetics is not about expertise, it is about evangelism. We do not study to win arguments, we study to win people. And that is far greater motivation than any degree. So here are the original bubbles for my project. I was supposed to read six books, interview six professionals, write five apologetics versus propaganda essays, write four comparative religions essays, do extensive work in curriculum integration. I had to suggest core competencies for biblical knowledge at Grace Prep. I had bonus bubbles of creating an evaluation tool for biblical literacy, an assessment of the student's ability to defend the faith, and then the egg bubble. So here are some of the books I read. The date below is when I finished each book. The first book I read was I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. In this book, Norman Geisler and Frank Turek argue that Christianity is not more, only more reasonable than all other belief systems, but than unbelief itself. I read Evidence That Demands a Verdict. In this book, it invites readers to tackle their doubts and to ask tough questions. This book counters all skeptical claims that, most, that a skeptic would ask, and it's nearly 900 pages. Mere Christianity. In the classic Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis explores the common ground upon which all those of the Christian faith stand together. The Case for Christ. In this book, The Case for Christ, Lee Strobel cross-examines a dozen experts with, from, who have doctorates from schools such as Cambridge, Princeton, and Brandeis, asking hard-hitting questions building a captivating case for Christ divinity. More than a carpenter. This book tackles questions about Jesus, such as, is he really Lord? How can we know for sure? This offers arguments from a skeptic turned believer, Josh McDowell. Here are some of the other books I read. I read The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. In this book, C.S. Lewis examines the universally asked questions if God is good and all powerful, why does he allow people to suffer? Jesus Among Other Gods. This provides answers to the most fundamental claims about Christianity, such as, aren't all religions the same? Who is Jesus? And can one study Christ's life and determine that he is the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus Among Secular Gods. In this book, Ravi Zacharias and Vince Vitale defend the absolute claims of Christ against the modern belief in the secular gods of atheism, scientism, scientism relativism, and more. Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. In Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, Nabil Qureshi describes his dramatic journey from Islam to Christianity, complete with friendships, investigations, and supernatural dreams along the way. Faith. In this powerful reflection, President Jimmy Carter contemplates how faith, faith has sustained him in happiness and disappointment. He considers how we may find it in our own lives. So here are some of the interviews I did. I interviewed... Dr. Craig Blomberg, he is currently a distinguished professor of the New Testament at Denver Seminary. He earned his PhD in the New Testament, specializing in the parables and the writing of Luke Acts. In addition to writing numerous articles in professional journals, multi-author works in dictionaries or encyclopedias, he has authored or edited over 20 books, including The Historical Reliability of the Gospels, Interpreting the Parables, and more. Sean McDowell, he is the author, co-editor, or editor of over 18 books, including So the Next Generation Will Know, Sharing the Good News with Mormons, Evidence that Man's a Verdict, and, any, and many more. Dr. Edwin Yamauchi, Dr. Yamauchi was a history professor at Miami, Ohio University. Mr. Yamauchi had authored, has authored and edited numerous books, including Greece and Babylon, Persia and the Bible, The Archaeology of New Testament Cities in Western Asia Minor, and many more. Dr. Joe Duff is a professor of biology at the University of Akron. He earned his bachelor's in biology and has earned a PhD in botany from the University of Tennessee. His research focuses on understanding biological diversity by examining differences in DNA sequences and genome structure. He is currently a writer for BioLogos, an organization that promotes the idea of Christian theistic evolution. Mr. Body Hodge attended Southern Illinois University and received a bachelor's and a master's in mechanical engineering. Currently, he's a speaker, writer, and researcher for Answers in Genesis USA. He is the author of The Fall of Satan and the co-author of 
of Dragons, Legends and Lore of Dinosaurs. I also interviewed Randy Kohick, who is a former FBI agent, and he was also the former Grace Prep apologetics teacher, and I interviewed Jay Warner Wallace. He's a Dateline featured cold case homicide detective and a popular nas national speaker and a best-selling author. He became a Christ follower at the age of 35, converting from atheism after investigating the claims of the New Testament Gospels using his skill set as a detective. I also got to have a short conversation with Ravi Zacharias and Vince Vitale. Now, this wasn't a formal interview, but I got to talk with them for a good 15, 20 minutes at the State College Airport. Ravi Zacharias has spent the past 45 years commending the Christian faith and addressing life's biggest existential questions with, about origin, meaning, morality, and destiny with eloquence and grace. Dr. Vince Vitale is the director of the Zacharias Institute, and he's a trainer, speaker, and writer for the Zacharias Institute. I also, pretty soon into my project, I realized that I wanted to talk to non-Christians as well to hear their side of the story. So I arranged interviews with a leader in Judaism, Islam, and atheism. David Ostrich received his education in Northwestern University and Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. During his 36 years in the rabbinite, he has specialized in small congregations. He's the editor and complier of two prayer books, and he's also a le lecturer of Jewish studies at Penn State University. Meher Fellenbaum received his master's degree in mathematics from Penn State University in 1995. He was the vice dean of student affairs at Dhamam College of Technology in Saudi Arabia, and he is currently the president of the State College Islamic Society. Dr. Michael Shermer is the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, a monthly columnist for the Scientific American, and a presidential fellow at Chapman University, where he teaches Skepticism 101. He's the author of Why People Believe in Weird Things, Why Darwin Matters, The Science of Good and Evil, The Moral Arc, and Heavens on Earth, The Scientific Search for the Afterlife, Immortality, and Utopia. For this final interview with Dr. Shermer, I was kind of hoping that he would challenge my faith, but I really found the culmination of all my researches. I really was unimpressed with his arguments, and honestly, I found them a little weak. One cool note is that after our interview, he asked if we could turn the interview into a podcast. Uh, it was called Why People Believe in God. Now, he doesn't know if there's an exact number of how many people listen to it, but he said that on average he receives between forty to 50,000 people that listen to his podcast, so somewhere around then would have listened to this interview. Here's an interesting comment by someone who listened to the interview. <laughs> The next part of my project was to write five essays about hot topics in the field of apologetics. Most of this writing has been published on my blog. The first essay was about how we got the canon. This essay focuses on the origin of the Christian canon and how the Bible got to where we are today. Did we Jesus really resurrect from the dead? This essay tackles numerous alternate theories offered by skeptics about Jesus' resurrection. A biblically faithful Genesis. In this essay, I argue that there are numerous biblical, biblically faithful theories on Genesis, and it does not matter whether the earth is old or young. Alleged contradictions in the Bible. In this essay, I talk about supposed contradictions in the Bible and why they don't actually contradict each other. Books excluded from the canon. In this essay, I talk about books that aren't in the Christian canon and why they aren't from God. I also wrote four comparative religion essays. These are essays that talk about the differences between Christianity and other religions. I talked about the differences between Christianity and Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, and Buddhism. I created a document based off that and submitted it to Mr. Lay. These core competencies include things such as biblical literacy, apologetics, and basic tools for evangelizing. The curriculum integration aspect of my project is very complex. I just wanted to list all the different parts of it before I get into each one individually. In the beginning of the year, Grace Prep students completed a survey in which they asked their biggest questions about Christianity. From these questions, I created a Grace Prep student questions document. Now, then I started to work with the staff on how we could an best answer some of these questions. We answered some of these questions through chapels, and we also answered some of these through the apologetics curriculum. Here are some examples of the questions that we talked about in chapels, such as Mr. Jones on why people die young, Mr. Lay on how to hear God's voice, and Mr. Gresh on why people go to hell. Part of my original bubbles was to suggest an apologetics course option for Grace Prep. 
Given that our focus was on big questions this year, I worked with the staff to put the course I suggested into action. This course was based off the book I read called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Frank Turek and Norman Geisler. It focuses on these four main questions. Is there truth? Does God exist? Is the New Testament reliable? And are miracles possible? Sorry, I mixed up the order there. Students were broken into classes based off the grade, and we had a three-day cycle of watching a video provided by Frank Turek, reading the book and working on a workbook and discussing these questions. Here's a couple of testimonies from the curriculum. Through the apologetics course curriculum, my own personal faith was challenged and pushed me while we answered some of the hard questions, and God showed me so much about himself and his creation. One of the biggest questions I have taken away from this study is how important it is for people to know what they believe and why they believe it. Grace Moyer. Here's an... Here's another quote. It, the apologetics curriculum, does not change my belief, but it does give it a good challenge. More questions have been raised, and I'm definitely a fan of it. I do think this curriculum has made me see more evidence and arguments from the Christian side. Some of them are incredibly smart and persuasive. It has definitely challenged and made me consider my own beliefs. I don't know what will happen in the future, but this curriculum may be start of my path towards Jesus Christ. Kwan Nguyen. I created a bibliography that contains a list of Christian books in numerous genres. A lot of it is used from the Alicia Childers bibliography that Bob sent me earlier in the school year. It contains resources for apologetics, Christian living, the Bible, creation, and many other topics. For my blank bubble, Mr. Gresh said to create a plan for the future of Grace Prep Apologetics. After discussing with the teachers, we created a plan for the future of the I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist curriculum. This curriculum will be administered every other year to upperclassmen. This is going to start during most likely the second semester of the 22-23 school year because everyone here will have completed this course by the end of the school year. Due to the heavy academic content of the curriculum, it's going to be given to students who have already completed multiple years of high school. And additionally, it's going to be best to complete this in the second semester so that there is enough time to go through this coursework. It's a very long curriculum, but it's been very useful, and I think it's a great tool. Um, something fun extra that I got to do was substitute teaching. I was asked them mo multiple times to substitute teach when teachers were out. So I got to talk with the sophomores two different times about the dating of the New Testament and the question of was Jesus um, just a moral teacher. And I also got to substitute teach for the juniors one day. And we talked about why well, I played the role of a skeptic. And we talked about different supposed flaws in the New Testament. One of the core competencies was to read the Bible in four years, and I saw a way that we can immediately put this into action at Grace Prep. Grace Prep students have started a Bible plan on the YouVersion app with the goal of reading the Bible in four years. The plan is titled, Read the Bible in Three Years, ironically, but the plan is divided into 12 90-day sections, and students are going to complete three sections every single year, and if a student is at Grace Prep for four full years, they have read the entire Bible where they're at Grace Prep. Here's a testimony from that plan. It, the Bible plan, helps me to put my focus on God and meditate on his word at the beginning of every day. I'm excited to read through all the Bible, including the parts that are not what I personally would have picked to read. Esther Moss, class of 2022. I worked with Mr. Canizero to bring Grace Prep students exposure to the outside world so that Grace Prep students would not just be contained inside of a Christian bubble. So we created this program called Apologetics in Action. Grace Prep students went to Penn State to survey students. Grace Prep students asked the five big questions that any worldview must answer and then an additional question about Jesus. Those five questions about origin, identity, purpose, morality, and destiny. Students were also able to lead the conversation further if they felt led. Here... Here's a testimony from that. The evangelism outreach was an amazing experience for me. It made me realize how much of a Christian bubble I am living in between grace prep, work, and family. I don't have a lot of experience in hearing how non-Christians think. For me, it was a breath of fresh air. We met some really cool and kind people, and no one came off as resentful or offended. In fact, they were very kind and polite. Jake Canizero. One of my bonus bubbles was to create an evaluation tool for biblical literacy at Grace Prep. I found a lot of these questions based off a of Biblical Literacy 101 website that I found online, and all the Grace Prep students took the test, and also five staff members at Pure Freedom took it as well. The average score for a Grace Prep student was a 34 out of 50, and the average score of the five people who took it from Pure Freedom was a 42 out of 50. Here are some of the frequently missed questions. The percentage tells you how, what percent of the students got the question right. So 29% of the questions knew, students knew who the major prophets were. 38% knew who appeared with Jesus at the, at the transfiguration. And there's some just other, the most commonly missed questions. Another one of my bonus bubbles was to create an assessment of the student's ability to defend the faith. 
I created a test that evaluates a student's ability in the field of apologetics. A lot of this is based off my research and just seeing what skeptics have said about Christian claims. So I think this test, if a student could pass this test, I think that they would have no problem with their faith being challenged when they go to college. And this test is going to be given at the end of the apologetics curriculum. We would have taken it earlier, but I figured it'd be best to wait until everyone had had full training in the apologetics before they take, took this test. For my egg bubble, I created a survey that asked adults some of the big questions about their worldview. Thanks to everyone who shared it on social media, I had over 1,681 respondents from 51 countries. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who shared it. Mrs. Dana Gress shared it, and I had a lot of responses. There's also a very famous atheist Facebook page with like 50,000 likes that shared it, and I had a lot of responses thanks to them. So I just wanted to go over a couple of the really interesting results that I found. If you want all the results, you can check out my website or my blog or something like that. So the first thing I noticed was people are losing their faith by age 14. As you can see, 78% of the respondents were raised Christian, 62% of respondents were Christians at age 14, and 50% of respondents were Christians currently. Christians are divided on the Genesis debate. 40% of Christian respondents believe that the earth is over a million years old. 27% of the Christian respondents believe that humans evolved over a long period of time. And 41% of the Christian respondents believe that genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 contain gaps. Consistent church attendance and parental relationships matter. As you can see, there's a big gap between people who left the faith and people who stayed in the faith off of key issues such as consistent church attendance and how strong their relationships were with their parents. One thing I really found interesting was the 45% of respondents who said that, of Christians who remained Christians that said they had a very strong relationship with their parents, whereas only 22% of people who were raised Christian and left the faith that they had a very strong relationship with their parents. Adhere to apologetics. After my interview with Jay Warner Wallace, he encouraged me to write. At first I resisted, but I could feel God moving on me, so eventually I decided that I would do it. And after a few weeks of doing this, I invited Carl to do this with me. Um, we have over 13,500 views on our website from over 100 countries as of this morning. We have over 6,400 Twitter followers and over 280 likes on Facebook. And we also have 1,300 views on YouTube. Just an example of something we did for promotion just very recently is this Christian Apologetics March Madness Tournament. So I'm a big nerd, and I love analytics and things like that, so I figured I could combine my passion for apologetics with an analytical sports March Madness bracket competition. Uh, this slide says we gained over 300 followers, but that was when the slides were due. I think as of now, I think we have gained over 1,000 followers since this happened, so it's pretty cool. Um, so I just want to give a few examples of many famous apologists actually took note of this and posted on their social medias. Uh, Lee Stobel just replied, tweeted, which was pretty cool. Dr. Michael Brown, he created many of these funny, like, old-school boxing posters and put his face and his Christian apologist opponent on it. It's pretty fun to watch him. He made some YouTube videos. This is very entertaining. Uh, Stan the Reason also just mentioned it, which is really cool. Greg Kukul is doing some amazing things there. And David Wood, who is a lesser known in the formal field, but he's a very popular YouTube apologist. He has over 300,000 YouTube subscribers. Him and Pastor Mike Winger just made YouTube videos telling people to vote for them. And that poll individually had, I think, over maybe 2,000 votes. It was a lot of votes. And the, view, the videos each had like 20,000 and 10,000 views, I believe. My mentor for my project was Dr. Edwin Yamauchi. I asked him to be my mentor shortly after my interview. We talked on the phone, and he sent me many books and scholarly articles. By that, I mean I have a folder about this thick of all the articles he sent me, and I probably have 15 to 20 books that he sent me in the mail for free over the past few months. I admire him and ask him to be my mentor because of his academic, academic bruteness. He didn't shy away from the facts, and he told it how it was, which I really appreciated. My learning stretch. My learning stretch consisted of two parts, an external and an internal stretch. Externally, I had to work on my communication. I had to, I had to learn how to operate on other people's time frame, and I needed to know how to have patience. I'm the type of person that wants, th wants things done on my time, not someone else's time, so it was very hard to me, for, for me to adjust to other people's schedules, but I found it very beneficial at the end. Anxiety. I had much anxiety throughout this entire project, and I always doubted myself and my abilities. I'm a perfectionist, and I wanted everything to be perfect, but I had to realize that I'm only human and that I'm going to make mistakes. 
my faith. My project has strengthened my faith exponentially. I now believe that Christianity is true not only in my heart, but in my mind. Now I'm not afraid of my faith, and I see it as the most important. The apologetics curriculum in the Bible reading plan will help strengthen the faith of all of the Grace Prep students for the rest of Grace Prep. I hope that I've inspired my fellow students to not be afraid of big questions and to not accept easy answers. I just wanted to say thank you to my parents for supporting me through this entire project. My advisor, Mr. Jones, for meeting with me constantly and always helping me with new ideas. I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Edwin Yamauchi, for all the time he invested in me and all the money, and I really appreciate it. And I also want to thank Mr. Bob Gresh, correct this on the slide, for my project originally looked a little bit different than this, but he changed my bubbles and everything was for the better, and I, it's just amazing how that all worked out. And I also want to thank everyone else that has supported me throughout the school year, shared my stuff, like I couldn't have done it without you guys, so I really appreciate it. I want to conclude once again on this quote because apologetics can be heavy and academic, but we cannot forget the true nature of the purpose of apologetics. Apologetics is not about expertise. It is about evangelism. We do not study to win arguments. We study to win people, and that is a far greater motivation than any degree. So thank you. Zach, soak it up, buddy. <laughs> soak it up. It's good. Let me first talk to you just briefly as a, as a man to man, okay? Not man to boy, okay? Very proud of you. Uh, during soccer season, I took you into my heart, not just as another guy, but I really wanted to see you do well. Uh, and we feel that as teachers, we feel that as parents, we feel that as coaches. But you were on to something that I saw that um, I'm seeing more through this year and even now. So let me say this to you. When you look at culture today and who are the culture shapers of the kingdom of God in the world, it's scholars too. Okay? And so I think you need to think about that. You have that capacity and tenacity of mind to be a scholar. Okay? So think about that. All right? Thank you. Um, Besides the fact being a coach in some sport as well. <laughs> um, yeah, a few thoughts here on that. You were very thorough, okay? Um, there's a lot of work that you put into this. Uh, I liked your assessment at the end. You got real anxious. I think you, you'll learn to deal with those in time. That's all soul care stuff, just how we think about ourselves and where that takes us. But you really were thorough. I love the fact that you had multifaceted. That's important in this. Um, at first, I wondered if you actually had talked enough to non-Christians, but you did that. What I would say is look at their books, too. I don't know if I mm -hmm. saw that, but really wrestle with them because some of them have shaken me in my own pursuits. Um, and so I actually had to pray over my heart. God, guard my heart. But it actually was good because it made my faith go deeper by reading their stuff. Uh, I just can't help but so so proud of you. Um, all right, as God said to Job, brace yourself while I question you like a man. <laughs> you have the making, okay? You have the making. Too much has been given, much is required. I used to hear that so often. But you have that, okay? What I would exhort you is where people seem to fall is a lack of integration, right, of what you've put together into your own life, head, heart, hand. And it's this part, the practice. I love this quote, and this is going to be the real key for you. Uh, I'm speaking here, obviously, for you, the man, as well as the, the future. Because what happens, Zach, there's a disconnect with the final piece, the acting on it, right? Mm -hmm. And it is about the people, not just the defense of an argument. And so I want to ask you this question. Um, when you did this research and you did this study, did you find, tell me about your compassion for people. What happened with that? What was that like? 
right? Because you did talk to some people, and, you know, we all chuckle, like, this one guy had a weak argument, but how did that compassion, where did, where did that go for you? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely, as I studied more and I did my research, I, started to, I really started to realize how important it was, like, Christianity, yeah. but also it made me sad to realize how many people are really, like, just against God. Like, I can just see, like, yeah. in some of these people, like, Dr. Michael Shermer, who I interviewed, he has a tragic, like, just, like, he had a tragic event happen when he was, like, I believe, like, 18, and it really, I think it really just derailed his faith, and I can see how these, like, terrible things have really hurt him. So, I mean, I feel like it, it's hard for me because I, I didn't have a personal relationship with him to have a lot of compassion, but I really understood the where it was coming from. Yeah, God will give you that. God will give you that. He does. Um, just a few remaining thoughts here as we get to the rest. Uh, just two thoughts here. Just, um, you know, I'll leave the rest for improvements. Um, it's amazing how your pace was fast, but you're so good I was able to keep with you. That's good. Uh, just be, be aware of your context. Not everybody will have that ability to do that with you. Um, and I'll just end with this. I exhort you, like God said to Jeremiah, let not the rich man boast of his riches, or the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, but let him boast in this, that he knows me. Go for that, buddy. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, that was, that was really great, Zach. Um, your presentation was great. I love how you started. And uh, for one thing, well, you did so many bonus things that it's almost like another project, okay? Because like, you're doing your goals, and then you're like, oh, and for this bonus thing, I did this. And so you just did so many things. It's almost unbelievable. Um, you started early once you got your project contacting those professionals. And I thought that was a really strong point because you had the dates of when you did things and I could see that some of those things were happening in June, some were happening in July, and you just never stopped working. And as soon as you got something accomplished, you thought, oh, I think I'll contact some people that I don't agree with, you know? So just how early you started and how you never stopped working was just very impressive. Um, the podcast opportunity, that just was a result of that, you know? You, it's nothing that... It was cool that it happened to you, but it's a, it's a result of you just working hard and starting early, you know, and doing a lot of great things like you did. I do read these portfolios, and your writing was very, very thorough. Um, whenever you said you were going to do research, you really did research, you know, <laughs> and you really did comprehend it and write well about it, so that was great. Um, curriculum integration, I would say, was more than we normally do for curriculum integration. So even that was like extra. So um, the, the analysis of the surveys also, that was a whole bonus thing that you didn't have to do. That was extremely interesting. Um, it was just, well, it was so thorough, so well done. There's nothing that I really can say that you didn't do that was, wasn't done well. Okay, so congratulations on that. Um, I guess my one question is, what does all this knowledge... I think, well, for my faith, I think it's really, like, helped my faith. Like, because I don't think I could be a Christian if I just knew it was true in my heart. Like, I feel like I need, like, empirical evidence, like, things that I can point to, like, say, hey, you know, Jesus isn't just this thing we see in the New, this guy we see in the New Testament. You can see this guy in his other works, or things like that, or things from, like, God existing. Like, it's really helped me, like, solidify my faith. Like, yeah, this Christianity thing is true. So, I think in my faith, and then, I guess, outreach, like, I enjoy, like, doing, like, the adhere apologetics, like writing and videos and stuff. Like, I enjoy that, and hopefully other people can learn stuff and benefit from my research. So I think, yeah. All right. Well, that was just really tremendous. Thank you. Zach, great job. Um, though I would never think of you as, like, a roller coaster person. The way you spoke made me feel like I was on a roller coaster a couple times. I was like, whoa, dude, slow down. Um, but that's it. Um, I, I was... I read a lot. I read all your stuff. Honestly, I kind of wish Pizza Hut still had their program where you get pizzas for reading. 
because <laughs> I would have had a lot of pizza. Um, and I loved it. I mean, to be honest, you took on challenges that someone your age wouldn't normally take on, and you did a great job with them. And um, I was really excited by that. The other thing, knowing your personality, knowing that you're a C on the, on the, the this scale, I know that <clears throat> you planned well. And we had a little inside joke that I wasn't a part of, but I, I heard that, you know, Zach almost has his eating your project finished, and that was before we started school. <laughs> and so when you came to me and asked me to be your advisor, I was like, oh, they weren't joking. That was not an inside joke. That was just a fact. Um, and so <laughs> I enjoyed that. I enjoyed looking at that and seeing somebody with that type of personality really plan far ahead. But I kept waiting for the bumps to come to see how you're going to do that. Now, one of the upsides of a planner is you don't plan in for bumps, as in, like, you have it weighed out. And I think it's interesting, the bumps, the only bump that came that I noticed you handled so well is when we decided that this is going to be harder for underclassmen to do. And I just the way you handled that with the grace and the ability to say, I think this only needs to be an upperclassman curriculum, specifically the, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, where someone would be like, why can't, why don't the underclassmen like this? You were like, no, I get that. Okay, <laughs> we'll do that. And I was really proud of you for, for making that jump real quick. Uh, along the other hand, with being a C, you also worked with other students. And they aren't all workers like you and planned in the thing. My question to you is how did you manage that and handle that when you were interacting with other people's projects, they were interacting as part of yours, how did you plan for their unplannables, so to say? Can you clarify the question, please? Yes. How did you deal with the fact that there are other people? Because that was one of your anxieties, too, was that people weren't going to work on your schedule. And so you had components like the Bible reading app you did with Carl, uh, some of the things that you did with Jake. Um, when they didn't work. And some people just aren't going to care, regardless of how hard you try, how hard you push them. Some people are just not going to want to do things. They're not going to want to read or do the Bible plan or things like that. So I just had to realize, like, you can't do everything, so just try as hard as you can, do as much as you can, go the extra mile, but at the end of the day, there's going to be people who just don't care, and you're going to have to accept that, and it may hurt them later down the road when they, yeah. Sure. Um, other than that, hey, you did a great job, and I, it has been a pleasure to work with you. You made my first year as an advisor easy, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so great job. Thank you. Yeah, great job, Zach. You're the Tom Brady of senior projects. You're the, you know, that's amazing. I mean, it's just, uh, um, I mean, I know the Eagles beat Tom Brady. I want to just <laughs> clear that up so somebody could potentially be the Eagles of Tom, of uh, senior project. But I, <clears throat> yeah, this project was, the amount of time I spent on this project was amazing, just reading your emails to me about the project. <laughs> I think I have more time in this project than any project in history, just reading the progress. Um, you did a really good job of keeping me informed. Uh, really good job. Really good job. And so, um, but you continue to, to expand the project. Um, wow. So, you know, this is an example of a project where you picked the right one and just got on early and everything and then it started having mo momentum. And it started, you know, I mean, momentum and critical mass are a serious thing. Uh, one of the things I noticed is you, you said you published over 60 articles. Those are the, I looked this morning, you've posted almost every day on your blog since January, right? Yeah. And I, every day since, I think you've already missed a day since January, right? Yeah. Not. All of them are mine, probably like 75% are mine, 25% are Carl's, but I mean, we have ever been posting, we've just been ahead of things, and I think we have things scheduled for like the next 10 or 11 days, so like we're on mm -hmm. a really, we've been doing a lot. Um, you've accomplished something I've been wanting to accomplish for a lot of years, we just haven't gotten it done, is just, you know, this defense of the faith, the uh, analysis of the students, the uh, biblical literacy to make sure we know what our students know when they're coming in and what they know when they're going out. Um, How did you meet Ravi Zacharias? Yeah, I meant to actually talk about that in my presentation, but then I accidentally skipped over it. So I took the SAT on Saturday morning, and then I got a text from, well, like a bunch of texts from like my dad and Mrs. Madeira, and basically I met them at the airport, airport because I believe Mrs. Madeira knew Rick Capozzi, and they're having like a pastor's meeting in State College with Ravi Zacharias before he left town, and 
Mrs. Madeira, just help me out with all that. And she got me to basically just, she's like, he's going to be at the airport at this time, and you just have to be there, and you'll run into him, and he knows you're coming. And so. So you just were that. there when he got off the air. He, he had to walk by you. Yeah, basically. That's good. That's good. So that's kind of what I, that's how you get things done. Um, there's only one door into that airport, basically. You, you, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that I've been watching the thing on Twitter, which I will tell you, I'm a good marketing person. That is one of the most brilliant marketing ideas I've ever seen in my life, the apologist March Madness. One of the dumbest, quirkiest, <laughs> awesomest things I've ever, like how that brilliant ideas come from weird places and that was, it was amazing. Thank you. Uh, you asked me to share some things to, to, to get you followers. Now I'm going to ask you to share some things because you have more followers than I do. <laughs> So if you'd be willing to, to share some of my Born to be Brave marketing, I'd be really <laughs> happy with that. So, um, uh, you know, what you see there is a viral idea. And what I thought was so great about that as I followed it is um, you really did help some apologists discover other apologists. You helped me discover, I thought the, the Kevin Wood guy, is it David Wood? David Wood, I thought yeah. he was hilarious. I mean, I actually started subscribing to these guys because I thought this is interesting. I mean, it got me involved. And that's the brilliance of that idea. It's not just it, was a, it wasn't just a spurious, goofy idea. It actually made me subscribe to people. And I'm sure they've seen that in their subscriptions too. They've seen some extra traffic in there. And I think that's where I think Michael Brown understood that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw the one vote was, there was 1,845 votes for that one, for that one yeah. contest because they were pushing it. And, it was just a really great idea in a, a bunch of ways. Um, I have a pretty easy question for you here. It's a no-brainer. If God is good and all-powerful, why does he allow people to suffer? I don't think it's an easy question. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, there's obviously everyone's going to have a different opinion, but my opinion is free will. Like when Adam and Eve chose to sin in the garden, like everything was perfect there. It was, there wasn't supposed to be suffering, but then... When original sin came, God said, all right, have it your way, and that's basically why there's evil and suffering. That'd be my Why doesn't he stop it? Why doesn't he stop it? Because God can't just be like this guy who just comes in, that comes in and just forces himself onto people. Like if God intervened more in the world today, you can't, we wouldn't have free will to choose him. We'd just be like, oh, well, we have to believe in him, so. Wouldn't that be better? I don't think it would because then we're not truly loving God. We're just like forced to love him because, or forced to, I don't know how to say it right, forced to believe in him because we know he exists. So it wouldn't really, we wouldn't be loving him. Then God wants us to love him. All right, good. Just wanted to test you there a little bit. <laughs> good job, yeah. Um, I think that, what I loved, part of the, what I loved, I didn't see in the binder, I guess, it must have been in there, but the fact that you were subbing for some teachers. <laughs> and what I love is that you actually are learning this stuff, not just doing it for the project, but, but learning it and taking it in. And I think it's just really hitting the, the sweet spot in your personality because I know you're a C in the disc test, but a, a C wouldn't normally come up with that, that March Madness bracket. So you have, you're so deep into it that you're thinking and integrating on a higher level some stuff and that's a really cool thing because what you did is you are putting your own personality into it and that's what some of these great apologists are doing that I'm seeing on the web. They're funny to watch. They have their own personality. They're not just transmitting facts. They're, they're able to um, take complicated concepts and put them in a simple uh, easy to understand stories and word pictures. Um, You talk really fast. <laughs> the others might be a little bit afraid to say it, but I'm not. You talk really, really fast. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of words getting spoken because you had a lot of words to say. So I actually just told them to, to turn the timer over back there because I was afraid you were racing against time. I thought, well, maybe if he doesn't know the time, he'll go along and that's fine because you said a lot of things. You had a lot of things to say, and 20 minutes isn't really long enough for a project of this caliber, but, but you will have to learn that just to relax. And you do on your videos. I've noticed your videos are very relaxed, and, and it's a different format, but 
it's something that um, I could keep up, but it was a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you were articulate. I mean, you were clear in what you're saying, but you had a lot to cover. And so uh, one of the hard things is like you probably spent a third of the time or more just trying to go through all the books you read and stuff yeah. like that. That's not as interesting to us as the other stuff you've done, but it again. One of the things that happens when you're presenting is that takes a lot of time to read a book. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to just gloss over that, but you've done so much other stuff that, that uh, um, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to uh, there's a certain sales aspect to a presentation too. Um, so that's one thing, you know, that uh, you won't often have to get so much content done in 20 minutes or however long it was. Um, What's next? That's a good question. Um, I hope so. I mean, I think I mean I'm obviously going to keep working on this blog and this YouTube channel and stuff because it's really been exploding. So I mean, I think just keep working on that and see where God takes me. I mean, I guess that's my plan. I don't have a definitive. Start ministries, and that's their plan. That doesn't usually work out as well as they think. People that just a ministry starts out of them because it's the story of their life or they're ministering through it is where it pops up and all of a sudden you have something you didn't think you were going to have because it's very organic. I would tell you this, that you are really skilled at the UN Carl, however, whoever's doing what. Uh, truly you have a blog that, like the Twitter thing, that everything that comes up, I'm like, oh, I should read that, I should read that. Now, <laughs> that's the good news. Sometimes I delete those things and I'm like, Every day something comes up, I want to read. I feel guilty every day for not reading it. <laughs> but you have a good skill for what's coming up there. Whether you're writing them or sharing them or whatever, it's, it's, um, it's really effective because the questions that you're ask, answering or asking on there are, it's hard not to click on them. Uh, I think that what the challenge always is, and I think Pete was saying, the same thing is it's the humble apologist. It's can you increase in knowledge and humility at the same time? Because it's easy to destroy people in arguments. It really is because most people don't, don't, can't argue and don't have any knowledge of it. It never, like it says up there, you know, uh, it's not that we don't, it's, it, we don't say to win arguments, you know why? Because we never argue anybody in the kingdom, mm -hmm. ever. And so it is a matter of compassion for people who don't know. It's also a matter of um, generally we don't, we're not arguing people into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of being there, sort of in their need, because the answer about pain is really a compassion question, not a scientific question. It's a question that's asked when people are at the end of the rope. They don't need to be argued with. They don't need to be convinced. They just need to be listened to. The answer to that question, nobody really has a great answer to it, mm -hmm. is the love of God, is how that envelops them during that time of grace. So the, the, the challenge is, uh, I think you have an incredible opportunity here, an incredible start. Um, the, the question is, can you be the humble apologist that is learning it, like that says, to win people, to bring people closer? Uh, because there's a lot of apologists out there that like to, to uh, argue. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess all of them do to some extent. I had to kind of laugh at their actual arguments for voting for people. <laughs> Dr. Michael Brown's headline was like, vote for the guy he was against. And then in the video, it was kind of like, the way you help the guy that I'm against is by voting for me because he's getting proud or something. I mean, they were all apologist sort of arguments. But I, I would encourage you in that. I think you have a great marketing technique that because it's coming right out of your passion it's just bubbling up and that's what really uh, makes a difference I'm sad that I've been gone so much this year because I I wanted to learn some of this stuff I mean the students are way ahead of me in their knowledge of this and I appreciate that because it's one thing that's very really important to me is an intelligent faith so I think that your consistency over the year you won you picked the right project for you and then you started early and you kept on it and then you got momentum earlier than almost any project I've seen and just started, then all your work was uh, 
was exponentially multiplied. So um, great job, uh, amazing project. I'm kind of relieved it's over because <laughs> there's so much work being done that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So, but I want to see the future of it. But uh, I'm glad you came to the, the, the finish line so far. I hope you move forward with it too. Great, great job, Zach. Thank you. I just want to say I'm proud of you. I, I think for me, watching, I think you got a lot of accomplishments over the years and a lot of things. Um, but I think what I'm proudest of is just how you've owned your own faith. Like you really, you talk about that day when you found out Nate died and you had some questions. And I think a lot of people would just shelve that and say, I'll deal with that later. But you didn't. And you have just owned your own faith, which is all that I really desire from you is just to make your relationship with God real. And you've done that and you have sought it out. Um, I will never forget last summer's vacation. I, you know, we drove to Key West and back just for, because that's what we did. And um, while most, when you weren't driving, most teenagers were probably sitting in the back on their phone on Snapchat or something. And you're sitting back there reading evidence that demands a verdict for <laughs> 3,300 miles. And um, you just, when you go after something, you go after it. I think the most important thing you can go after is your relationship with God, and you have done that. And I'm extremely proud of you for that. Thank you. Um, I'm proud of you, too. And I'm not just proud of your academics and how hard you work. And I never have to tell Zach to study, ever, um, <laughs> as a parent. But um, I'm, just, I'm really proud of your heart. And uh, your heart is amazing and so compassionate and so sincere and you never i never do not know what zach's thinking usually because his heart's on his sleeve all the time and uh you're just an amazing young man amazing and um i'd like to think i had a little bit to do in that so uh, <laughs> but i love you very much thank you all right dan probably wants to say something here i don't know why but i'm just going to take a little bit of time because well um I, I'm here, and that's a big deal because I, um, I, I believe that this project, I believe for a long time that this project isn't about just this project, but that God's planting and birthing something in you. Uh, whether that's prophetically true or not will be born out of the evidence that comes from your life in the years to come. I'm not saying that it's from the Lord. I'm saying I'm sensing it in my heart that it's something being born and birthed in you and i'm going to be praying for you i have been praying for you and i just even like watching the, the thing that stuck out to me as i watched that was the percentage of um atheists who do not have a strong relationship with their parents there is deep pain there and um the deep pain if that is met with Christian love and compassion and reparenting can probably be a road that leads them to Jesus. And so that's, I actually want to talk with you about those numbers, the statistics, because that's information that right away I was like, ah, as a, as a leader in helping Christian parents parent well, that's a really practical reason to slow down and forget about the dishes and the laundry and the mowing of the grass and all the stuff and just be connected to your kids. So there's, that's just one little aspect as I watched your project where we, I, I can learn, and we can learn, you know, you've taught us today. You haven't just jumped through some... Gone for all these weeks teaching and meeting with people and talking to them about how parent-child connectedness is one of the greatest risk reducers. We know that from psychology. We also know that now from a survey of 1,600 people that, you know, what I saw there was if parents who are connected to their have an active, open communication with their child are, are twice as likely, kids are twice as likely to maintain their faith. It was like 45% to 22%. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting statistic, and it's not out there too much, and it's, it's, it's like new research. 1,600 people is a, is a big deal. Ernie, you want to say something? 
I just appreciate um, what you've brought to the culture, um, and you've given us some uh, great resources and tools um, to help with the curriculum. Uh, you stepped in and substitute taught, which has been the trend this year. Uh, that's been great and helpful. And I think you you probably have more of a following here, not just on Twitter and some of the other things than you know. And uh, I just kind of watched as you were waiting for your project to start. There was just kind of a, a group up there congregating, just kind of talking to you. And I think that's the kind of personality that you have. And so I think that's going to do you well, too, as you move on to the next level. And I would just continue... I would challenge you to continue, and I kind of like that you said, well, I don't, I don't really have a five-year plan. I'm just doing what God tells me to do next, so proud of you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Coach Ginhart is here. I'm not going to take this time for everybody, but this is, you've earned it. I think you've earned it. <laughs> so, Zach, thank you. I got to watch you score 1,000 points over the last four years. I feel like I just watched 1,000 points in the last hour. <laughs> Um, and I mean that in a joking way and a serious way. It was really impressive work. Um, one thing that I'm just going to pick some pieces of what people said and maybe pull it together, which is um, you talked about starting with your heart and wanting to add your mind, and you're sharing a lot with people about the mind. You have an amazing personality, and your actions are so impressive of, as a person. Don't be afraid to use that to reach people's heart first and then go to their mind. Mm -hmm. You talked a lot about the mind part, but I've seen the person you are, and all of us know the person you are. Don't be afraid to share that and the why behind your faith also. Thank you. All right. Let's take a five-minute break and be back here, and uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do next, okay? So go do what you need to do for five minutes.